problem between history and memory is that they're not quite the same thing, but they are interdependent. They're almost like uh, two streams uh, flowing in a river in opposite directions. Uh, history tends to be what historians do. It tends to have this academic basis. It tends to be um, stories of the past rooted in serious research um, and uh, through evidence. And now that can reach a large audience, and the best of historians do. Um, however, memory tends to be much larger. It tends to be uh, the stories of the past, uh, the narratives of the past, that we come to live by or live within. We get those narratives, those memories, from all kinds of sources. We get them first from home and family. We might get them from church. We might get them from schooling. Uh, we might get them from a kind of ethnic environment we live in, maybe a racial environment. We get them from the groups we tend to identify with. And memory tends to be more sacred. It tends to be that story of the past that people want to own. They want to possess it. It's a kind of a heritage. Whereas history is always uh, trying to will away at it. Uh, it's trying to, as one historian said, uh, you know, memory is the tree, and historians are always kind of carving the bark off it. Now, that doesn't mean we're doing anything wrong, we're doing anything bad. It's just that we're trying to, to use evidence to tell, um, we think, usually, a more um, trustworthy or a more authentic or accurate story. Now, uh, that is not to denigrate memory at all. Uh, we are all part of memory communities. Uh, we, uh, we not only have to deal with memory, we have no choice about it. Um, public memory is far, far bigger than the history we write or the history we curate in museums. Um, the public's memory is far greater than the memory collected in an archive. Historians go to the archive. Some people from the public go to the archive to do genealogy or other kinds of research about their families. But there's always going to be this tension between what we've come to call um, social memory or cultural memory or the public memory and the history that historians or the academy writes. Uh, there's always going to be that tension. And sometimes it's a very politicized tension. Uh, it can have very rough edges because when you start writing about somebody's sacred text or sacred place or their favorite monument or the story they live within, as in the story of Confederate family, Confederate memory in the American South, you are now dealing with the source of someone's identity. And uh, that can get messy. But it's why this problem of history and memory is so interesting. They're perfectly capable of grasping this difference between the history historians write and then gets um, streamlined into textbooks perhaps, and then maybe even gets produced in a great documentary film, a documentary, or in, you know, they can understand that, that sometimes the deepest history comes through primary documents, which is, the, is, is all the vogue now in teaching, and it should be. So they can read primary documents, they understand that there are stories about the past that they're getting from sometimes oral sources, often oral sources. They might love their grandfather and the way he tells stories, but they're perfectly capable at the age of 15, 16, and 17 to grasp that uh, grand grandfather may make up half of that story, but it's still worth listening to. Uh, and they're perfectly capable of understanding that we need both of these, and we don't have much choice about it. Memory is going to keep growing. It just grows and grows and grows. We can't stop it. It's like kudzu you know, in the South. Um, you can't stop it. This is going to grow all over everything. Uh, the trick is to trim it back. <laughs> Where I'm going with this metaphor, you've got to trim it back, you've got to control it, and then you've got to live with it. And then you've got to write about it. You've got to explain it. You've got, you got to organically explain it. Um, young people can understand that history is always these two things. 
It is on the one hand a story. It's a narrative. We love stories. We're probably hardwired for it in our brains. What's one of the first things you do with a child? You tell stories. And as soon as they can listen, A goes to B goes to C, they're hearing a story. But they're also capable of understanding that history is about interpretation. It's about explaining things. We don't just want the past to come to a static. We want it explained. They get that. They can get that. Not because we beat it into them, but because we show it to them. And you can show it to them in a classroom. You can show it to them in a document. You can show it to them in a narrative in a textbook. I'm not against textbooks. I'm a co-author on one. <laughs> um, but you can also show it to them in a place, at a site, uh, getting them out of a classroom. Well, I was a high school teacher for seven years um, in the 1970s in the town in which I grew up, which was Flint, Michigan. I taught in a very large urban high school that was oh, uh, very racially diverse. It probably was 50% black, roughly 50% white when I entered. It was probably 60% black when I left. Um, we had all the racial issues and problems that the 1970s carryovers from the 60s could throw at us. It was a time when we were, for the very first time, creating courses in black history, uh, whether we knew what we were doing or not. Uh, it had a lot to do, I think, in the long run with my interest in studying memory, public memory, uh, not because I was explicitly aware of that, but during those years as a high school teacher, I, I spent five years uh, taking students from a Midwestern city on historical field trips, as we used to say, out east, uh, to Civil War sites, to American Revolutionary War sites, to Washington, D.C. museums. I particularly did a field trip to Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry, and Antietam with American high school kids from a Midwestern industrial city, most of whom had never been out of the city. Uh, and it was a way of showing them history, of taking them to places and sites. And we did everything from read excerpts from soldiers' narratives to read poetry out on the battlefield. Uh, I was my own tour guide at places like Harper's Ferry and Gettysburg. And I guess I was learning how to do public history of a kind uh, before we really called it that. I made good associations in those years and good friends with uh, park historians, national park historians, national park rangers, guides of that uh, era. Uh, and I think I learned a good deal from them about how you portray the past in a public play, in a, in a, in a famous sacred ground space like a Gettysburg. I would absolutely urge today's high school teachers of any kind uh, secondary teachers to take their students to places and sites. Uh, I have a good friend, uh, Lisa Cap, who uh, teaches in a private high school in Brooklyn. Uh, she happened to be part of uh, one of my teacher institutes about 10 years ago. And she has since created her own student school trip to Gettysburg. And I think maybe they go to Antietam and Harper's Ferry as well, I don't recall. Um, but many, many, especially on the East Coast, uh, you're closer uh, than we were from the Midwest. Um, but it's a common thing. I mean, the Washington, D.C. field trip for students is an old and common thing. You, can, you go to D.C. in the spring and you see, you know, a thousand buses. Uh, but to seriously take teenagers to a historic site and spend time with them, to get expert help, to get expert guides to help you, to, to actually teach them in the place is transcendent. I still get emails, occasionally from students. Uh, I don't even want to guess at what their ages are now, but they were my students in the 1970s who will see me in some documentary film or they'll read something I write that gets online. And they'll, I just had one the other day who wrote to me about going on the 1978 field trip to Gettysburg and he still says, you know, um, it's the, most, the thing I remember most from my senior year in high school. Now, I don't know if that's the truth. I'm sure he did a few other things that are probably more memorable and less educational. But um, that's always endearing. 
because they, they remember that. It sticks out in them. We remember by associations. We remember by those things that moved us probably emotionally. Um, and I'll never forget those days. I think it's some of the most important teaching I ever did. Uh, taking 40 or 50 high school kids to a historic site and getting their attention and keeping their attention through five days. I always thought, if I could do that, I could do anything. <laughs> Well, if teachers are going to go locally to a, a monument, a memorial of some kind, downtown on the square, or the Civil War soldier monument, or the whatever monument, one of the best things you can do first is to see if there are any local records about it. Local historical societies, civic records. There aren't always records, but there often are. At least something, at least a press record. You could probably find some press clippings. When was that thing unveiled? By whom? Under what circumstances? Who paid for it? What were the politics of the moment of its unveiling? If you can get even a little bit of that before you go see it, and you can say, okay, this Civil War monument went up in 1899. It was funded largely by, I'm just guessing here, but this could be the story. It was funded largely by the local uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy. It commemorates uh, a particular regiment that was uh, a unit in such and such a corps, in such and such an army, uh, they fought it here, there, and there. Uh, they lost, uh, you can get all this information now with the internet, um, or for that matter, in real books. Uh, they lost 30% uh, of their men in the war. This monument was unveiled to that regiment by its survivors. That's the story of many regimental monuments. Now, if it's the generic you know, Confederate soldier leaning on his musket and musing through his sideburns. Um, that too was purchased at some point from these monument makers that made a lot of money in the 1890s and after the turn of the century all over the country. And most of the monuments were made in the north, uh, in foundries and places like Connecticut. Um, but you can find out often a lot about those. When was it erected? When was it unveiled? Who spoke at it? Sometimes you can even uncover the actual unveiling speech. And there's a whole genre of those. Sometimes they're awful, but you know, uh, they died on the altar of, of glory of whatever. But still, um, big monuments, I mean the big equestrians, the big monuments to generals and presidents and so forth, or the big obelisk monuments, uh, in the north, they're called the Soldiers and Sailors Monuments. Um, those two all have stories. Uh, they have architectural stories, they have political stories. If you can even ferret out a little bit of the story of a local monument before you go visit it, then the students already have a narrative to place it in. They, they can, I mean, and maybe they can do the research. Let them go find out all this information. Now you, you have a context to understand this thing that you may have driven by or walked by most of your life, but don't know a thing about it. Uh, and then, there's a lot written on the, about the broader context of memorialization. Uh, you can read more widely now on, so how many of these were there? Why did every town have one of these soldier monuments? Uh, when did they go up? What's, what's this thing called the lost cause if it's in a southern town? Um, um, so, there's a lot, it, it, the point is to do some research ahead of time in local records, it's not that hard to do, and to try to get the kids to do it uh, before visiting a monument. Only then, I think, can, can you begin to understand well, what's the meaning of this monument? Why was it put there? What did it mean when it, when it was unveiled? What does it mean now? What does it mean to people today? Why do some monuments just fall out of meaning? They're just there. We don't even know what they're for. There's just that big thing you have to ride your bike around. Um, but why do other monuments cause controversy? Uh, are a problem, have a politics to them? Why are we having a debate about monuments today, particularly Confederate monuments? Um, this places them in a history. You know, if you think about it, every plaque Every memorial, every monument ever put up had a moment when it meant something to somebody to put it there. 
It might have had a crowd of 20,000 people at it. It might have had, uh, you know, th where three or more are gathered. Uh, it might have been a little plaque on a, on, a, on a side of a building. Or it might be a major obelisk monument in a city square. But every commemorative object and symbol had a meaning at its creation. I think that's what you challenge the kids with. Find out what that meant to the people who put it there. Why did they put it there? And, oh, and was there anyone who opposed putting it there? Can you find that out? For teachers, I would just say, you know, uh, never be shy of teaching the difficult problems in history. Uh, the, the, there's almost nothing in the past, at least at the high school level. I'm not an expert on what you can teach to the seventh grader or the fifth grader or the third grader. But from the high school level on, um, there's almost nothing that's happened in the past that we should shy away from. I mean, there are ways to be careful about it with young people. Uh, you got to know what emotional ground they stand on. You got to know their own background. Uh, you got to know whether they know anything about it. But we can't be afraid of anything that's difficult in the past. Because if we are and we don't teach about it and we don't learn about it, it, that difficult history, is waiting to come right back around and get us. Because it will happen again. What you're doing in teaching history is you're preparing young people for the history that's going to happen to them. What may or may not happen to them in the history they're going to live through has in some way happened before, and it's the only way they're really going to be prepared for it.